Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> on behalf of uh, Paul Spellman and, the, uh, and myself and the rest of the uh, members of the uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma working group, analysis working group, uh, we want to really thank the NCI and NHGRI for, for putting this together. Uh, as a, on, a, on a personal note, as a urologic surgeon who's worked on the genetic basis of kidney cancer for 31 years now, I would say this uh, project and the our previous project we worked on, the TCGA clear cell and the TCGA chromophobe kidney cancer really are sort of the dream of a lifetime. So what we're going to talk about is the uh, comprehensive molecular character characterization of papillary kidney cancer. Uh, just for background, uh, kidney cancer is not kidney cancer. It's a number of different types of cancer that happen to occur in this organ, different histologies, different clinical courses. We'll talk a little bit about the genetic basis of them, obviously. What we're talking about today is papillary kidney cancer, which makes up 15 percent of kidney cancer. And what we knew when we started this project, what has been a given for a long time, about 25 years now, is that papillary kidney cancer, roughly, is divided into two types, type 1 and type 2 papillary kidney cancer. Type 1, from a clinical point of view, is a relatively homogeneous disease, appears clinically to be more indolent than type 2 uh, kidney cancer. At this point in May of 2015, by the way, we have no effective forms of therapy for any type of papillary kidney cancer. The NCCN guidelines, if a patient comes to someone like me with advanced papillary kidney cancer, is to put them on an experimental trial. We have seven drugs approved for kidney cancer, primarily targeting the DHL pathway in clear cell kidney cancer. We have no drugs for this. Now, what we know or the field has known most about the papillary, about the genetic basis of papillary kidney cancer really comes from a couple hereditary types of kidney cancer, the first one being this hereditary papillary renal carcinoma, HBRC, which is the inherited form of type 1 papillary kidney cancer. The gene for this, of course, is MET. In all of those families, you find MET mutations in the uh, activating MET mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain, and a few MET mutations had been found in sporadic papillary kidney cancer prior to the starting of this study. Now, m most of us who manage patients, you look at uh, type 2 papillary kidney cancer, you say, my word, that is a very heterogeneous disease. At the NCI, we even refer to them sometimes as non-type 1 to, to, tell, our, to uh, tell ourselves we really don't understand these cancers very well. You can think of, you could say clinically and uh, uh, phenotypically that these must be about three or four different types of cancer, and we'll talk about that. Uh, again, what's been known a little bit has been uh, found from studying hereditary types of this of type 2 papillary kidney cancer, a disorder called hereditary myomatosis renal cell cancer, a very aggressive form of type 2 papillary kidney cancer uh, caused by mutation of the Krebs cycle enzyme fumarate hydratase. So in this analysis, of course, 161 samples uh, looked at copy numbers, somatic mutation analysis, methylation, mRNA, microRNA, and protein expression analysis. We will not talk about whole genome uh, sequencing uh, in this talk. So initially then, and we had a lot of discussion about this, I must say a little controversy about it, whether we should actually, actually have our pathologists look at these and characterize them. Uh, we decided as a group that it was the thing to do because that's what we do clinically and that's how we think about these, and we think they're very different. So our, we put together a group of expert pathologists, really are expert pathologists. I would say the five best kidney cancer pathologists, well, I would say in the world, but we'll say in the U.S., uh, and they looked at an incredible job, looked at these, had a single slide to look at off of Frozen, this is not perfect, but they did a great job. Uh, characterized 75 of them as type 1 papillary kidney cancer, 60 as type 2 papillary kidney cancer, and 26 they really couldn't call, they called them unclassified. And I think it was their sense and our sense that most likely most of the unclassifieds were actually type 2. Now, in the initial analysis, looking at copy numbers. So when you looked at copy numbers, uh, there were basically three different clusters. 
Uh, cluster one was uh, relatively stable genomically, uh, f a few uh, numbers of gains and losses. Uh, if you looked at cluster two, very different. Uh, you most notably, big time increase copy uh, chromosome seven, also some 16 and 17. But the big thing here in cluster two is, is increased copy number seven. For cluster three, a lot of deletions, a very genomically, you might say, unstable uh, uh, type of kidney cancer, uh, and most notably, uh, we would say, would be uh, deletions of chromosome nine, and we'll come back to that. Now, if you look at the clusters for survival, cluster one and cluster two, uh, clust clustered for survival, pretty close. Uh, cluster one was more uh, type two papillaries. Cluster two was almost exclusively type two. And cluster three had the poorest survival. Uh, that was mostly uh, uh, type two papillary and high stage, stage three and four. Now, when you looked at mutations, and this was done by looking at MUTSEG 2.0, and then also we evaluated genes uh, that were identified in PANCAN 21, and a number of notable genes were identified, MET, of course, uh, FAT1, SETD2, which we'd seen, of course, in clear cell, uh, NF2, a KDM6A, BAP1, PBRM1, uh, SMARC uh, uh, B1, uh, NERF2, STAG2, P53. The uh, chromosome 3 chromosome remodeling gene mutations that we had seen in clear cell kidney cancer, uh, that being SETD2, BAP1, and PBRM1, chromosome 3 chromatin remodelers, uh, were mutated mostly in type 2 papillary kidney cancer. We then looked at a number of uh, pathway, the pathway analysis looked at mutations and pathways, uh, found a number of pathways uh, that were notable, we thought, uh, one of course being MET, other uh, pathways such as HIPPO pathway and a number of chromatin modifier pathways. The SWE uh, SNF complex was mutated in uh, genes in that pathway in about 20, 27 percent of, of uh, type 1 and type 2. Chromatin modifiers in 30 and 30, 35 and 38 percent, both in 1 and 2. And the HIPPO pathway uh, mutations uh, were primarily uh, in type 2 uh, papillary kidney cancer. Now the MET mutations uh, that were found, uh, 14 MET mutations were somatic, three were germline. Most of them were in the tyrosine kinase domain, had a couple outside the tyrosine kinase domain, one in the juxtaglomerular domain and one in the SEMA domain, and they were all except one uh, type 1 papillary, well, either type 1 papillary or unclassified. also found a specific MET splice variant in eight samples, resulting in loss of the first two exons and the gain of a novel exon uh, of MET. Not, ex not unexpectedly, but when you look at MET uh, mRNA, significantly higher in type 1 versus type 2. Same thing for phosphomet. So we find amplification of seven, mutation, splicing, an increased copy number of chromosome seven, primarily in type one papillary kidney cancer. We'll come back to that. Also, a gistic analysis revealed a specific region deleted on chromosome nine containing this, the CDKN2A, P16 gene. Uh, CDKN2A uh, hypermethylation was identified in 10 tumors. Each of these, both the mutation and methylation, correlated with low expression of P16. And when you looked at the 21 altered cases of either silencing, loss, or mutation, they were almost all uh, either type 2 papillary, 71% uh, uh, or unclassified. When we looked at survival, of all the tumors, of the, all the type 2s, the ones with uh, CDKN2A mutation had a significantly uh, decreased survival uh, versus those that were wild type. Excuse me, this was all 
of the, uh, of the tumors, all of the papillary tumors. We also found uh, TFE3 and TFEB fusions in 12% of type 2 papillary renal carcinoma, which was surprising. This is a surprisingly high number of TFE3 and TFEB fusions. Traditionally, we would think of it as being more like 1%. Uh, including patients in their seventh and eighth decade, which is also surprising. Usually, we think this was originally TFE3, we originally described in kidney cancer in 1996, and we traditionally think of it as tumor in children and young adults. But it turns out that's not the case. The TFE3 the TFE fusions also included four known fusion partners, as well as two novel fusion partners, and both of the TFEB fusion partners that we identified uh, were also novel. Now, when we did methylation analysis, uh, we saw a number of things. We saw three different uh, clusters. One of them, which demonstrated a CPG island methylator phenotype, the SIMP phenotype, and eight of the nine SIMP phenotype papillary renal carcinomas were type two papillary renal carcinoma, and the SIMP phenotype strongly associated with somatic or germline fumarate hydratase mutation or decrease levels of FH. That's the Krebs cycle enzyme. Again, when we looked at the SIMP papillary renal cell carcinoma phenotype, uh, we found that it was, it characterized early onset papillary renal cell carcinoma, and low survival. So it's a very aggressive early onset phenotype. Now, when we looked at a number of metabolic genes, what we found was we think pretty remarkable. When we looked at glycolysis, fatty acid synthesis, AMPK, and TCA cycle, what we found was in the SIMP phenotype, so here we have the SIMP phenotype, here we have type two, and here we have type one papillary kidney cancer. In the SIMP phenotype, this was very, very characteristic. Increased glycolysis, increased uh, pentose phosphate shunt, decreased TCA cycle, okay? This is like your classic Warburg metabolic shift. Increased glycolysis, decreased TCA cycle. All right? That if you look then at the type two papillary kidney cancers, what you see is a shift toward increased glycolysis and pentose phosphate shunt, but decrease, uh, but, but normal oxfos activity, looking at gene expression patterns. So this would be consistent with what we see clinically, i.e. that patients with papillary kidney cancer, very high PET scans. So what this would suggest then would be that those tumors are doing have shifted to, made a significant shift to aerobic glycolysis. Now, when you think about that, then you could also imagine that those tumors also would be characterized by increased oxidative stress, increased reactive oxygen. So we're gonna come back to that in just a minute. So think about these type two papillary kidney cancers, the poster child being the SIMP tumors, but the other papillaries as being very metabolically active. So how do you put this together? Well, this was the model, very similar model that we saw in clear cell kidney cancer in the, in the Kirk paper, in the clear cell TCGA paper, in which we saw with high grade, high stage, low survival, aggressive clear cell kidney cancers, we saw a metabolic shift toward aerobic glycolysis and decreased oxfos. We're seeing the same thing here, exact same thing here in the SIMP phenotype. Increased glycolysis, increased pentose phosphate shunt, and decreased TCA cycle activity. Now, when we did looked at cluster of cluster analysis, the COCA analysis, we saw uh, four different uh, four different uh, four different clusters basically. And this was uh, uh, Chad Creighton and, and Katie Hundley did, did a beautiful job putting all this together. And the, uh, the first cluster, uh, C1, uh, you can see here, 
is primarily type 1 papillary renal carcinoma. And the cluster, cluster 2A, 2B, and 2C are type 2 papillary. And the cluster 2C is, went completely with the SIMP phenotype. Cluster 2B, which I'll show you is the very aggressive type of type 2 papillary, was also characterized by a significant increase in the number of set V2 mutations. So then if you look at survival, if you just look at type 1 versus type 2, type 2 papillary kidney cancer has decreased survival over type 1, which is what our clinical experience would fit with. Then when you look at the cluster of cluster analysis and look at survivals, the, uh, the C1, which was type 1 papillary predominantly, and C2A, which was one of the clusters in the type 2 papillary uh, uh, kidney cancer cluster, uh, they did very well, relatively well uh, to each other relative to survival. The, the cluster 2B, T2B, uh, is uh, significantly worse uh, survival than C1 and C2, and the SIMP, of course, is the, the 2C, is the worst survival. Now, finally, uh, we looked at a uh, number of pathways, including this one, uh, which were our most prominent pathways when you did pathway analysis. And we talked a minute ago about the type 2 papillary kidney cancers being characterized by, potentially, by increased reactive oxygen, increased metabolic stress, uh, and a more metabolic shift to aerobic glycolysis. Now, a very uh, pretty study by Ben Tay had shown, looking at array patterns in type 2 papillary kidney cancers, that this fit with this pathway, which is the NERF-2 pathway. And NERF-2 is the, uh, turns on uh, NQ01 and the antioxidant response pathway, which is essentially a defense against reactive oxygen, uh, oxidative stress. This is also something that many of us are working very, very hard uh, to target and we are very hopeful that this will be a targetable pathway. So because we're so desperate to find therapy for this, we're hoping this may lead us down the right path. But when you look at the NERF2 pathway, and the surrogate here is NQ01, which is kind of a perfect readout for NERF2, as you see with the C1, which is predominantly papillary renal carcinoma, and then the, the 2A, 2B, and SIMP, you see that the NERF pathway is increasing uh, in those versus the uh, type 1 papillaries. And you can see that also correlates with mutations in this pathway, which is NERF2, COL3, and KEEP1. And when you look at survival, we see significant decrease in survival in the tumors that have increased expression of NQ01. So, what we show in this study is that type 1 and type 2 papillary renal carcinoma are genetic, genomically distinctly different tumors with different clinical outcomes. The type 1 papillary renal carcinoma is associated with MET mutations, MET splice variants, and gain of chromosome 7. The type 2 papillary renal carcinoma is made up of at least three distinct subtypes with differing survival. The CDK and 2A alterations are associated with type 2 papillary renal carcinoma and with poor survival. The TFE3 and TFEB gene fusions are found in 12% of type 2 papillary renal cell carcinoma and are found also in older patients versus just in younger patients. That the SIMP type 2 PRC, PRCC phenotype tumors are early onset, poor survival tumors characterized by a metabolic shift to aerobic glycolysis and decrease oxidative phosphorylation. And finally, that the NERF2 pathway is upregulated in type 2 PRCC and is associated with high grade, low survival papillary renal carcinoma. Thank you very much. for one or two questions, if you want to come to the microphone. Um, thank you for your 
presentation. Could you give more details on what you saw about the unknown subset with respect to gen the genomic alterations you saw? You started your talk by talking about the fact that there was an unknown subset. Do you understand that? You had a non-type 1, non-type 2, a third other category. Where did they fit in? That's the question. But they're not type 1 or type 2. Well, unclassified. You're unclassified. Where are they? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. The unclassifieds, I'm sorry. The un sorry. Good, great question. The unclassifieds uh, really, okay, so get in. The unclassified, that was by pathology. And that was by looking, all we could do was take the frozens, make an H and E. TCJ did a great job on this, getting into those slides, but really hard for pathologists to make a call on that. Anyway, so the 26 unclassifieds we had, most of those fit with type 2. Okay, so our presumption is those were really type 2 papillaries. Yeah, but I was wondering if they were related to one of the subsets of type 2 or not. You know, that's a very good question. I'll have, you know, I don't know the answer. That's a very good question. In other words, where would they fit in with the TFE3 or the others? That's a good question, and I, I don't have that in my head right now. We'll have to look that up, and I'll get back with you on that. That's a good question. We didn't analyze that specifically, although we should have. So I wanted to ask about the non-met mutated type 1 tumors. Uh, any ideas as to what the drivers are in those that Boy, sort of make that up is, for met? That is a very good question. And um, that is something we are desperate to know. And I hope you recognize that I, we said chromosome 7 increased copy number. We didn't say that MET was the target there, because there's a lot of stuff. It is incredibly characteristic of type 1 papillary. But what the driver genes are, we don't know. That's a very good question. So we would assume. And we've got the whole chromosome 7 to think about, including EGF, HGF, all sorts of things. Uh, we have increased copy number. We have increased, we have increased uh, phosphyl met. We have increased met. But is that the target? That remains to be determined. That's a very good question. We also have 16, 17, but we don't know. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Our next talk is Dr. Angela Books, who will be telling us about the high-throughput somatic variant impact phenotyping using gene expression signatures.